Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's webinar, Using Network Segmentation and Micro-Segmentation to Improve Enterprise Defense, brought to you by Dark Reading and Gardacore and broadcast by Informa. I'm Sarah Peters, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You can participate in the Q&A session by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A window to the right of the presentation window, and then click the Submit button. At the end of the webinar, we'll ask you to complete our feedback form. Your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. You can also launch the survey at any time by clicking on the red survey button at the bottom of the console. If you're experiencing any technical problems, please type your issue into the Q&A text area and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now on to the presentation, Using Network Segmentation and Micro-Segmentation to Improve Enterprise Defense. Discussing today's topic are Gal Sponsor and Dave Klein. Gal Sponsor has many years of experience as an independent security professional and is a trusted advisor to CISOs of large corporations, technology and pharma startups, Ivy League universities, and nonprofits and NGOs. Since 2014, Gall has specifically focused on emerging threats to availability as well as confidentiality. So that's like ransomware and destructive attacks. Dave Klein is Senior Director of Engineering and Architecture at Gardacore. With more than 21 years of real-world cybersecurity experience, he works with Gardacore teams, customers, and industry thought leaders to address the challenges of securing modern hybrid cloud environments. So these two gentlemen have a lot of really thoughtful and brilliant things to share with you today. I'm so excited to hear from both of them. Gal is going to take it away first. So Gal, I'd like to turn that over to you. All right. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, we know you're super busy with all your duties, blue team, red team, and other. Um, very interested in this topic. Um, I've been talking about segmentation for a long time. If you've ever seen a dark reading webinar with uh, me as a presenter, you've probably heard um, me discuss it before, but uh, today is uh, specifically about segmentation and a little bit about scope. Um, we just assume that most of the people here are interested in defense uh, in terms of blue team audience. We defend our orgs and help others, and we want to understand how we get attacked and also flip that around as knowledge into how we defend. So most of the scope for today is looking at understanding what segmentation does for us as defenders in terms of east-west visibility and lockdown as opposed to north-south. North-south is things like inbound phishing or egress uh, on the way out, things like that. Most of the uh, security products out there are around north-south. Uh, we're focusing today on east-west. And the goals for today is understanding some of the attacks perspective, uh, how we look at uh, their interactions with our network as defenders, some of the sample tools and techniques, and then obviously prioritizing defenses so we do our job effectively. This is uh, just a baseline. Some of you have seen this before. This uh, came from uh, John McCumber when he was with the Air Force slash NSA back in the early 90s. It's called the McCumber Model or McCumber Cube. And I, every time I give a presentation, uh, I challenge people to find me an activity that we do in information security that is not directly related to something here. So our job, as uh, McCumber saw it, and I agree, is to bestow confidentiality, integrity, and availability onto data during the states of transmission, storage, and processing with the security measures such as education, training, and awareness, policy and practices, and obviously the technology stuff that we uh, love and hold dearly. And uh, another uh, piece of the kind of larger mental model of how I look at Blue Team, this is from Wendy Nather. She is uh, uh, today with uh, Duo and Cisco, but she has done a lot of work on Blue Team as uh, security management up to and including CISO work. Um, so uh, at the bottom of this uh, pyramid of IT needs, kind of this Maslow hierarchy, is making it work. Uh, then we have to keep it working. And then uh, all the little pieces of technology have to interact as a system uh, instead of just pieces of the system to work together. And then we have to change it, uh, things like patching and configuration management, change it without breaking it, which is a huge part of why a lot of people have not yet segmented their network. They're worried about breaking things, they don't even know what will break and how bad it'll break. That's part of what we'll talk about today. Uh, we have to protect against the wrong changes. And then uh, stupid users, uh, I think that's a, 
an internal joke, and in information security, we don't really believe there are stupid users per se, only bad architecture and bad uh, blue team. Everybody clicks. I've clicked something before. Um, it happens. We have to architect around that. Uh, so uh, no, uh, no offense meant. Uh, and then obviously the auditors, which are a constant uh, threat. And these days we have to add privacy in addition to the security audit uh, because GDPR in California and New York and everybody is adding their own uh, special sauce of what privacy means to them. And I've seen that also impact some security planning uh, because we can get some uh, pretty intrusive uh, data collection in order to do good blue team stuff, but in some cases that uh, trips the wires for the privacy assessors, so we have to balance that as well these days. And obviously at the last but not least, our favorite thing is attackers, people who maliciously try to get us in some way. This is another piece of the mental model, uh, another triangle. So we had a cube and a triangle and another triangle. So Rich Mogul from Securosis uh, discussed this uh, simple idea that in order to grab our stuff, we need to first get an initial exploit and get a position on the network, whether it's a file server or a laptop or a telephone these days. Uh, and the typical IP and PII breach, which is what we've been mostly focusing on as InfoSec people up until ransomware uh, started kicking our butts, is getting the data and exiling it. But in order to do that, we have to get the initial position, find the data, and then egress it out of the network. In some cases, that's easy. In some cases, that's hard. Uh, Blue Team really needs to be able to prevent or disrupt the initial exploit, but assuming they have a position in through, say, a JBoss exploit or RDP brute force on the server side or spear phishing or drive-by on this client side, you have to assume that they're, quote, unquote, in, and then we have to understand what does it mean to disrupt or delay their movement laterally before they get to the data they want, and then they have to egress. So that's the idea here is we, up until the point where they actually package up the data and egress it, we don't have a breach per se, we just have an incident. Now ransomware and some of these worms that are happening in the last few years uh, can happen in a matter of minutes and destroy an entire company and just leave a smoking crater. But uh, a lot of the IP, PII, and even some of the server-side ransomware can take days or weeks because uh, the initial exploit is not sufficient. They have to move around and plant the keys and get the malware going and then detonate. The cool thing about ransomware from an attacker point of view, and also we have to calculate that from a blue team point of view, is they don't have to package it up and egress it. They just have to run that initial exploit and get that lateral movement. So whatever is impacted by the ransomware, we're now their client and we're in negotiation mode and recovery mode uh, because there's no egress necessary. So that's an interesting aspect of uh, monetizing ransomware versus PII or IP, you don't have to actually steal anything. You just have to, to demolish it. Uh, this is our friend, uh, the This Is Fine Dog. He's on our uh, ship, SS Ship It. And there's so much change and so much interaction with code in various places and various platforms, on-prem, uh, in cloud, uh, private or other data centers, containers, serverless, you name it, uh, DevSecOps, all of those fancy terms. Uh, we have to understand what it means for us, and uh, the ability for us to keep up is uh, just part of that security arms race with the bad guys, but also with just the pace of change. And here's where we have an interesting discussion around InfoSec is we have, uh, in many cases, an audit mentality where we're looking at uh, flaws, and we have a production of checklists, which are good and necessary for us to do our work. We have to understand what are the, some of the basic things that we need to do. But again, part of that arms race is the, the technical community is both uh, deploying code uh, and platforms that we don't fully understand or know how to um, protect, but also the bad guys are creating tool sets to exploit that and even just new tools for the old stuff that we have not yet uh, figured out how to fix. So the idea of uh, some of the rest of these slides uh, going forward is to how to balance protection versus detection response with the understanding that we want to do some good graph thinking. So one of the things that the red team says, hey, I want a local admin, and ideally I want a domain admin. And the fun thing about graph thinking is that when you find a machine and you dump the creds using something like a Mimikatz, and you can read the creds in plain text. You literally can have a 60-character random password generated five minutes ago, but if I have Mimikatz, I don't need to offline crack it. I read it in real time in plain text. You need to look into that if you don't understand that. Uh, now I want to take that local admin and see if I can uh, use it as a skeleton key to the rest of the network because in many cases the IT team stamps out the image with the identical local admin. So it becomes a, a uh, skeleton key. 
On the blue team side, we need to understand this is how they do it and that understand that a local admin misconfiguration or failing to do that checklist piece creates a graph effect because we now have uh, the ability to move laterally very quickly using built-in tools like PS Exec, and there's no malware involved per se. Another thing we have to understand is we never want to misuse uh, the domain admin or the Uber God mode admin to actually administer any servers and certainly not clients other than the domain controllers. So that's really important to understand how the bad guys look at our uh, graph, not just from a networking point of view, but also from an identity plane. This is an example um, of a graph thinking and Mimikatz uh, on a terminal server. If you look at the at the left there, that's a kind of a big spaghetti ball of all the users that are logging in from the, the terminal servers and they're eventually going into the network where they actually have to access uh, their resources. So on the left, you see someone who has a position on the terminal server and they want to get into the middle there with a high value asset. And on the right, there's a magnification of a, a couple of attack paths where you have on the left the terminal server and directly in the terminal server, those two green men, uh, those are laptops that have an identity and they have an indirect path to the high value asset on the right. And so actually, as you uh, look at the attack paths, there's no direct path from the terminal server that you own to the high value asset, but you can hop your way there. And understanding that graph thinking and how it defeats the kind of checklist only thinking is really important for us. And this is absolutely related to the idea of segmentation uh, at the network and identity plane together, ideally, and even more so. Uh, this is an example of uh, further drill down from there. The, the, the person who um, created that uh, blog post is uh, from uh, Microsoft. That's his Twitter handle uh, from Trustworthy Computer Center. And the red team, again, studies the infrastructure as it is, not just as an inaccurate mental model, which we use uh, basically on an incomplete in asset inventory system or a data network diagram. And an example of a blue team uh, flipping the, the, the script on the bad guys with graph thinking is using something like Bloodhound with a Neo4j graph database powering it, and that's a free tool, it shows you the attack graphs and the dependencies and how uh, close or far you are from that actual uh, a target for the bad guys. So these are things, for example, called derivative local admin rights, and when they uh, crunch through the information of what is it that your local admin as an explicit admin on the bottom right there has five, it actually unrolls, if you will, to 335 derivative local admins as they're crunching through the graph. So that's really important to understand that a small foothold on the network can give you an enormous near skeleton key capability using graph thinking. Uh, so we'll go through a, a quick um, uh, attack path. And our goal is to sell PI for money, let's say, and this is from 2012. Uh, we are going kind of back old school to um, uh, enterprise uh, pre-super uh, blue team uh, awareness. This is the, kind of the, uh, the, the pivot for a lot of people to understand that, hey, InfoSec is really uh, a, a very real thing and a lot of management um, and audit and financial support started coming our way. Uh, this was a, uh, a demonstration of how a graph asset uh, would help us. So on the left here, there's a screenshot of the attack matrix for the enterprise from MITRE. And on the right is a link. I would suggest that you follow that after the webinar. It's a, a Mandiant report that it was public as a summary of what happened to the South Carolina Tax Authority, basically the state IRS, and had millions of uh, breached uh, accounts. So that uh, link on the bottom shows you an interactive way to look at the different um, uh, ways to go through your network all the way from initial access on the left to the exfiltration and command and control on the right and everything in the middle. And obviously there's a, um, a several graphs in there around a lateral movement between discovery, lateral movement, and collection. And that is a lot of reconnaissance, so we'll see through that. This is a, a screenshot from the Mandiant Public Report. And if you look at what happened here, the initial exploit, the initial uh, access was on August 13 of 2012. And then the attacker took a couple weeks to understand what's going on and finally logged on to uh, the Citrix uh, server that we saw earlier using some of the legitimate credentials that they got from the initial exploit on the initial laptop. And there's not a lot of malware happening here post that initial exploit, even though it took two weeks. So here we have an idea of executing utilities, grabbing accounts, and then doing more interacting with 21 servers, performing reconnaissance. 
and then interacting with eight servers, performing more reconnaissance, interacting with six other systems, performing reconnaissance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have here is a multi-week, multi-month in this case, uh, idea of a person got in through the client side on spear phishing, for example, but they really are in your network looking around for the data. Around, uh, with the breach, mo the breach triangle from Rich Mogul, they got the initial exploit, now they're looking for the data, and eventually they have to package it up and exfil it. But they, in, the, in the meantime, they're doing a lot of noisy stuff with all kinds of utilities uh, and all kinds of reconnaissance activities that are not malware per se, but they are things that they have used maliciously against us using our own tools in many cases. Some of us recognize our friend from the movie Airplane. He is a, a mischievous lad who wanted to uh, create little effects by unplugging runway lights, for example. Um, and another aspect of red team and blue team these days is it's not just stealing stuff or monetizing uh, secret information, but rather just destruction uh, for purposes of extortion, like ransomware, or in some cases just because. So with ransomware, uh, you get to uh, lock things up and demand money. Uh, with a destructive attack, you just say, hey, I'm just going to destroy it and, you know, good luck to you uh, trying to you know, climb your way out. And in some cases, like with a Sony attack in 2013, that's to really maliciously, personally kind of attacking uh, people by dumping their executive emails and they said some not so nice things about the President Obama at the time. It was very embarrassing. Uh, voicemails, etc. On Blue Team, we have to understand what does it look like when we mitigate the impact I'll repeat that, mitigate the impact of the initial exploit and the initial detonation around a destructive attack. So we have to be able to use proper segmentation at the uh, network and identity planes and, and even uh, uh, more granular than that if possible and absolutely make sure that we have offline backups and make sure that the backups are actually offline. So th those are the things that we need to understand and we have to start asking ourselves existential questions like, do I understand what it means to rebuild AD from scratch because it's been demolished? Do I understand how to do that even if I did have offline backups? Has that ever been even practiced or considered? And then this is really a matter of DRBCP, not so much InfoSec, because it becomes a catastrophe and it's an unannounced catastrophe. Unlike a hurricane, for example, you get nuked by an Apecha 2.0 and you're having a bad, probably a bad quarter if, uh, if you're recoverable. So segmentation, what is it that we're trying to do? What we, under, what we need to understand is that, yes, segmentation is important, but again, uh, to the Wendy's pyramid of, of uh, IT pain, how do we change things or even view things without breaking things? And we want to view things in order to be able to change things and understand what would break when we change them. So visibility comes first, and iteratively we start changing and understanding what happens. So one, we have to understand our assets, where our machines are, what users and applications are, uh, uh, resident on those machines, and we need to understand what the access patterns are between the users and applications, the databases, the operating systems, and of course all that happens over the network. So that is a critical path to understanding segmentation in order to do it without breaking the things we don't want to break. We need to be able to prevent stuff without breaking things, but also we need to be able to at least detect and respond or remediate quickly when prevention is not yet possible, and that's that iterative process. So there's an emerging market for several years now uh, for segmentation tools at various layers. Traditionally, when we think of segmentation, it's usually focusing around the network side of things, but not. Uh, I, I feel that's necessary but not sufficient because, again, we talked about identity, for example, and that's critical. So we have to understand what is it that we want to segment. Is it just our on-premises uh, network? Does that have any kind of uh, dedicated pipes to an uh, external data center, or is uh, we're using public cloud to act as an external data center? And so is that really one network or two networks? Do we have kind of a standalone uh, disconnected cloud environment? All those types of things. The minimal kind of viable product for understanding segmentation in my mind is understanding, okay, what if we took all the desktops and laptops, the clients, off the network, quote unquote, from the servers? And what would that look like and what would we want to see in terms of, again, access patterns from users and applications to the databases and the networks so that they would be able to do their job without breaking things? So that's back to that, how do we not break things? So some of the things we want to consider is this idea of an intent-based networking rule sets because it is really easy to get kind of enmeshed in this spaghetti ball of pain of a lot of policy and routing and um, uh, whitelisting and blacklisting 
of what things should be allowed and not allowed, and it becomes really unmanageable, unruly, and very difficult to do change management on because it's just so complex. So there is this idea of intent-based networking uh, around simplifying your policy set where you say, I don't want this to connect to that. And really, any time that happens, X to Y, we need to at least be alerted and understand what, that, what happened there so we can look into it. So the personas we want to consider is just three of them that you, know, you need to look at. is InfoSec, obviously, we want a blue team to mitigate the risk and chief compliance. The network and the host and identity people want to get their jobs done on time. And then there's obviously the users who need to get their jobs done from the, their devices and reach that apps and the data. So the question is, where do we sprinkle that security goodness? Security awareness obviously needs to happen for the people who run the network, the hosts, on um, the operating system side, a lot of TCP IP trickery that can be done in terms of locking things down and reducing noise. And then obviously the architecture side to kind of put it all together. Network, obviously network gear is traditionally thought of uh, firewall routers and switch and how the client servers and apps interact. And then at the application data uh, layer, we want to understand against that intent-based networking of, I want to be able to authenticate from X to Y, but I don't think it makes sense to authenticate from X to Z, even if it's a properly uh, uh, received uh, correct password because of all the identity stuff going on with, uh, with the uh, Mimi cats and so on, and the replay. So architecture needs to decide, segmentation is important, what does it mean for our org, and understanding all that fun stuff. Red Forest, for example, is a type of segmentation that uh, protects your uh, domain controllers at the top of the AD food chain. That's one example. And uh, you know, zero trust is a, is a term. I think it's a, it's a neat term, but we really don't zero trust. We kind of trust less things less often, but at the end of the day, we have to trust certain things. So I kind of call it asymptotically approaching zero trust. So what are some questions for vendors uh, at the network, identity, or specialty segmentation vendors uh, that we need to ask? So is this project or a consulting service that will help us understand what's going on? Are you a product or are you some sort of hybrid where you can help us uh, do both with ProServe and a product? Uh, what's your pricing model? How do you price this? Because we have uh, you know, a bunch of developers, a bunch of users, a bunch of servers, a lot of bandwidth. How, how does that uh, jumble in together to, towards some sort of cost model? What is it you're helping me protect? What can you help me protect? Because I have a, usually these days, uh, an, an enterprise uh, a model with some attachment to uh, cloud extensions, some disconnected cloud, a little bit of both. How does that work? And then what kind of infrastructure would you require from me to help you use your products or services? And where does that work? Where does that fit? Where does that go? Is it a bunch of appliances, hardware or virtual? Are there agents involved? What kind of coverage do you have in terms of operating systems and applications? And what is it that you need? Uh, what will you break, obviously? Another piece of this is as you get closer to POC, you have to ask, what does this look like? What do I need to do to prepare and understand before what's going on? And specifically, who do I need to involve? These are teams of distinct uh, expertise inside of your org that need to be involved. Certainly the DevOps folks, the application people, network, database, operating system, etc. Uh, the security people and the logging folks need to understand what's going on. If there's a SIM, where does that go? Um, we need to understand this can get really noisy. This could produce a ton of logs. Not just how many gigs per day, but how many events per day. Because that actually, in many cases, is as important to the kind of computational intensity of the logging process and analytics process as just gigs per day. Because these are a ton of tiny little discrete packets of event logs. And that's a part of your overall TCO for this project for understanding what this is producing uh, while it's detecting and helping you get that visibility so you can change things without breaking them. Another piece of it is you want to understand what is it that my network here is capable of today and how is it that your product or service will integrate with that. And last but not least, asset management and identity management. Do I have a CMDB? Do I have good identity management processes and tools? And how will that uh, be leveraged to get a better, more efficient uh, approach to this uh, effort? We want to discuss a little bit about metrics. So you have to you've got to come up with some of the metrics for success with your management and the vendors you're engaging with. What kind of metrics are you going to be able to produce for us to understand what's happening at all of these layers? So in terms of identity, we looked at the mandate report. There was one identity trying to spray a password to several dozen servers at the same time. Would we be able to detect that? Uh, what, what are the users doing with their passwords and with their uh, network access? 
Uh, what's happening at the TCP IP layer on the operating system, and how do we iteratively lock that down? So, the, you know, SMBV1, for example, we're trying to all get rid of it, but how much of that is there, and what would break if we turned it off? That's a huge problem. Uh, Host-based firewalls is another rich source of uh, logs. The switches obviously tell us what's happening laterally quite a bit. Uh, and then there's all the authentication logs um, where we explicitly pass a, uh, a service account or a user account to a, a login screen. Uh, what's going on with, uh, with encryption in terms of uh, uh, file and operating system activities? There are rates of these things happening and that could indicate you know, ransomware spreading or, or good things. Uh, obviously the applications as, as the, kind of the, the, the diamond mine of the segmentation, we want to get to that layer uh, as soon as possible. And then uh, how do we understand the growth of uh, policy sets so that they don't become unmanageable? These are some of the uh, metrics you want to start generating so that you'll have something to hold them accountable to. And the summary is kind of, you know, really applies to everything in InfoSec, but specifically this very complex project where we're trying to understand what's going on in the kind of invisible world of the east-west traffic. Uh, there are no silver bullets, but we have to have a process by which we gain that visibility, iteratively understand, can we turn this off or reduce this or get kind of minimum, maximum rate alarm or something like that, and then iteratively become more secure. And obviously we want to apply that to where the old and new is in on prem and cloud with the various threat vectors and tactics that we've seen played against us and that we understand are part of our threat model. So there's a ton of permutations, um, uh, seemingly endless, but we really want to be able to focus on the patterns that are emerging in terms of layers and interaction uh, to gain visibility and then iteratively use that to gain uh, prevention. Uh, and obviously we want to optimize security productivity for our various teams, DevOps, network, host security, and using a mix of products and services. Uh, don't underestimate the amount of time it'll take internally with those various teams. This is a big project. Uh, the main thing is get to that first point where you're seeing more than you used to and you'll start understanding where you can uh, move the knobs and switches from there. And that's, uh, I think, everything I have. Over to Excellent. you. Uh, okay. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, Kyle. Really appreciate it. So I'm Dave Klein, Senior Director of Engineering and Architecture for Gardacore. So Gardacore and our Gardacore Labs, we are a software-defined segmentation solution. That's another word for micro-segmentation. We have tons of experience in this field. And we're going to discuss, uh, and not just for our solution, but for all solutions, what is really needed to be successful in software-defined segmentation in solving the problems that Gal talked about, about lateral movement. So besides Gardecore Center, I mentioned we also have uh, Gardecore Labs. Gardecore Labs is our expert team of individuals uh, who work together and really research and understand lateral movement and east-west traffic within data centers, within clouds. Uh, they man a, a, a global sensor network all over the world to find uh, new threats and have actually published and discovered many uh, things on critical vulnerabilities that they found, uh, new threat actors, APTs, uh, and the like. And the neatest thing is they've given back to the community. So these two things you see here, folks, when you're done, please uh, Google or go to our, our Gardecore site and, and take a look at these. Uh, number one, uh, we have a cyber threat intelligence, also known as CTI tool. Uh, we manage a unique threat feed that really focuses on east-west traffic uh, as an intelligence store. It can be used by everyone, including you, for free. Uh, it's used by our customers, it's used by many cloud providers. It's something that if you're doing some forensic work and you want to find out something, we may have some information for you. You can get to it right on our website. We also publish a free tool on GitHub called Infection Monkey. Infection Monkey is fun. It's a great way to do penetration testing in your and looking for lateral movement in the clouds and containers. Uh, as public and private cloud, as well as on-premises. You can download it. It's free. And uh, most importantly, uh, it really gives you a report when it's done scanning through, telling you, here's some things you probably want to remediate. It's 100% safe to use. So, again, these are two free tools. I'm sorry, one's a threat feed and one's a tool that we give back to the community that are available for your use. So, in looking at what Gallus talked about very eloquently, when we look at 
north-south traffic, uh, assume you're breached, right? The, the north-south types of protection are going to fail. And it comes down really to two critical elements. One, humans are humans. <laughs> and even if you train them uh, the best you can, there is always going to be someone who's going to click on that URL, open that email, open that attached Word document. So the point is the humans are going to, going to fail you even if you do training. And then also a lot of the research I've been involved with is the non-human stuff, is looking at big breaches that occurred on direct attacks into applications, data centers, and clouds, things like poor passwords, lack of two-factor authentication, uh, poor account management. There's all sorts of fundamental hygiene issues that we see out there that still get taken advantage of. The attackers aren't getting smarter, not getting brighter. They're just taking advantage of humans and fundamental problems they see, including exploitable protocols like uh, DNS redirection, certificate life cycles. There's all sorts of things that they take advantage of. So between the humans and some kind of hygiene stuff that we have in the environment, when you look at north-south traffic, the walls that we create to protect ourselves have already been breached. They have fallen. And therefore, you need to, to consider yourself already had and need to think of new ways of protecting yourself. So Gal introduced us to, I, I'm not sure he introduced us, I think people know about this, the McCumber Cube, uh, the Maffer Pyramid, and the Mogul's Triangle, uh, John Kindervog of Forrester. And looking at the problems we have today with east-west traffic, uh, came up with a zero trust model. Okay, so this is not just a, a pyramid or a cube, it's actually a number of concentric circles or orbs or how you look at it. But it's really critical and applying this to what you're doing to see that fundamentally you need to have protection on your east-west lateral movement throughout your, your, your data center. And it involves people, workflows, network devices, understanding how you deal with automation and orchestration, as well as visibility and analytics. So instead of walls, what we really should be thinking about are ships. And the way ships are, are built today, if you've ever seen a, a harbor and people working on them, um, they're built with the idea is that the hole at some point is going to be breached and they, you want to survive. So you have compartments or segments within that hole to keep uh, water that is that flows in contained to certain areas and therefore survivability is almost always ensured. So the challenges that we have in today's environment, the hybrid cloud data center environment, if we're taking this ship model into consideration, is that 99% of the ships that we deal with in the hybrid cloud data centers are already at sea. They're brown fields. And even the new ones we create, that are green fields, go out to sea and within a few months they're brown. And they all have the same kind of problems. There's a heterogeneous mix of platforms, end of life and legacy operating systems, all the way through to modern operating systems, hypervisors, clouds, containers. And they also move faster. DevOps has done a great job at accelerating our ability to meet business needs. So you have auto scaling, dynamic models of provisioning like Chef, Puppet, Ansible. And therefore, not only are we dealing with, with, with the challenge of heterogeneous environments, but also speed has accelerated. And these are things that we have to take into consideration uh, in looking at ways to do software defined segmentation. So traditional methods that we would use in the past on premises for VLANs, firewalls, and ACLs. The problem is these are only port level. They're not granular enough, granular enough, I can speak, granular enough, and not fast enough. You can't deploy these quickly. Uh, and they have nothing to do with identity and processes and fully qualified domain names, other types of ways we might want to create policies. It's kind of only segmenting to a certain extent and very difficult to actually do. Uh, when I talk to my customers, I say, well, how long does it take to deploy a new VLAN? They go, oh, geez, it takes an act of Congress. In the cloud, unfortunately, native cloud security groups, which is what VLANs are when you're in the clouds, um, have the same kind of problems. It's only layer four, so only port-based. You can't change them quick enough. Not granular enough to include things like identity and processes as well. And you have no visibility. Uh, so it's pretty much the same thing as VLANs. These are traditional segmentation techniques that really don't scale and work in the way that we need to 
to do segmentation appropriately today. So when I think a successful micro-segmentation solution must have, there's uh, some things that come into mind. The first things first, as, as we talked about in the challenges section, you have to be able to work across a whole wide array of platforms that currently exist from ancient ones like Unix, uh, Windows 2003, all the way through the most modern. You have to tie into all those different heterogeneous environments orchestration because that orchestration details that you get gives you context, tells you what you're looking at. Uh, and that's really kind of important to be able to be successful. And the key is, is that's how you are successful. Um, also, you need to start with visibility. I think uh, uh, Gal talked about uh, a John Lambert uh, quote. It said, attackers study the infrastructure as it is, not as an inaccurate mental model viewed from an incomplete asset inventory system of dated network diagrams. This is important to understand. You need to have the ability to say, I need to know how my applications work uh, and what they're doing, uh, not only in real time historically, and you can include all the data for context, be able to uh, take an enterprise's existing CMDB or other things and import it in to also get additional context, but you need that real-time and historical visibility in order to be successful. On top of that, uh, we talked about policies that are more granular than port-based. Port-based uh, security is not something that is, is uh, much of a defense. You need armor that's much more thick and, and, and provides less gaps. You need to talk about processes because the point of, of view is you, the process is you're, you're, you're locking things down in a more tight fashion. You need to deal with identity, who's accessing what. You need to be able to do a uh, fully qualified domain name policy as well. And then beyond whitelist, you need to be able to do blacklists. And what does that mean? Being able to sit there and say, we have some overall policies against certain things in this environment. And when I get to the demo section, you'll understand why that's really important. And of course, finally, wizards to a system policy. The ability to take that visibility you have that you begin with in creating these maps and create policy easily. And then with enforcement, what's really critical here uh, is that you need to be able to enforce on all these different workflows at a deeper level than usually the firewall that comes with the operating system. For example, in Linux, you have IP tables, uh, and IP tables are only port level. So that granularity that you must get to must be also include identity and other things as well. So you want to get uh, beyond what is generally found in, in a firewall that comes with an operating system. Most importantly, it should be a, a unique from that firewall because you must be below the administrator. Administrators should come in and simply change some rules on you, and you're, you're back. Your policy is no longer valid. Also, we find that if we're, we're below the firewall, we get less latency. And finally, uh, you need to offer agent-based uh, options as well as agentless methodologies and appliances as well. So you should be able to approach a, a solution and say, hey, in these situations, I can't use agents. Great, we have agentless ways of doing this as well. So in looking at the solution, Beyond just being able to do segmentation rules and policies, you should also have the ability to have additional breach detection and incident response capabilities as well, because this will help you in cases where you have a policy in place and something's getting through. So having additional things in, in, your, in your toolkit in that solution, like a, a sandbox, file integrity monitoring, and reputation that's based on lateral movement is also critical. So finally, what is most important is when I talk to a lot of my customers, the biggest surprise I get is when I mention micro-segmentation, a lot of them wince and think, oh, that sounds very complex, it sounds difficult. And then the key is with our experience, what we found is, is helping them to understand that micro-segmentation doesn't have to be complex. It can start with low-hanging fruit, things that will make your environment more secure from a very base perspective is what, where you could start. And when I look at my customers, they generally start with things like some basic, basic policies to protect the environment, go after some critical infrastructure, and slowly work their way into full micro-segmentation. It's a journey, and what we find is even if they just start that journey, they understand the value right away, and as they go on, they can get into uh, doing uh, greater and greater things. But the key is they can get the benefit from the very beginning.
So I have a few screenshots showing you examples of things that are important to have in a segmentation solution. So this first one, I'm going to talk about the, the, the importance of real visibility mapping. So what you see here is a map of a data center. And as we said, our, uh, most of our customers have a heterogeneous environment. You see in the middle, you see uh, Kubernetes Docker with an OpenShift uh, uh, environment. And you have a bunch of web servers. You have a proxy over here. And then in your VMware environment, you have some databases, and you also have some container databases here. Being able to go ahead and in real time and historically map out those application dependencies like this leads to the ability to easily create policies. And that's why it's important to have this kind of visibility. If I click Next, you can see we were able to take these different parts of the environment and quickly create a policy down at the process layer. I know it might look small on your screen here, but the beauty here is it means that as a security administrator working with a DevOps person, you can quickly map out an environment as it truly is, and very quickly, with the help of the auto detection and the wizard, find out what processes are talking to each other therefore locking it down in the greatest way possible. Next example is process level and black, the importance of process level and blacklisting. If you look here, what you see is, uh, and I, I talked about this going at the low hanging fruit first. Uh, when I look at my customers, usually they say the first thing we want to do is, you know, any plain text protocols where passwords are seen, they have to stop. So FTP, uh, TFTP, and Telnet need to go away. Well, in our environment, because we can have a blacklist and we can be at the process level, this could be as easy as three rules. What we find in, in other types of solutions that are just whitelist, it's very difficult. So, for example, this FTP example here, you'd end up having to have, you know, 65,535 ports listed here because FTP can work across all sorts of higher level ports. But simply because we're at the process layer, we're able to stop it no matter where it occurs in three simple rules. It's much easier to do than uh, solutions that don't also include blacklisting. And the importance of identity. Val talked about one of his examples, jump boxes. And what I find is with my customers, they usually start with what I showed you before, some, a simple blacklist of things that shouldn't occur in the environment. But then what they find is those jump boxes are critical to control. Why? Most places today have a lot of contractors and, and vendors and other people in their environment who need access to certain things but not others. So those jump boxes, it becomes very important to understand identity and allowing access to only certain things. In this example here, you see this, uh, Andy is from um, one, one company. He's supposed to take care of accounting. Doug's supposed to take care of a DMS application. So having a, a software-defined segmentation or micro-segmentation solution that can add identity into the policies means that you can actually lock the people down at, at a greater extent and follow zero trust to a greater extent and make sure that, again, the people go to where they need to go and not other, other places. Without this capability, you'd be stuck getting different jump boxes for different companies uh, for access. This way, you're able to use one set of jump boxes for everything. And the end result is basically allowing them to get access to where they need to be, not where they're not supposed to be. And the key is the solution also should do this in real time. So the point is if you have, you have active connections that currently exist, you can put a policy in place, you should drop them to where they shouldn't be. And the importance of fully qualified domain names and policies. When I look in environments today and how they're auto-scaled and, and dynamically provisioned, IP addresses are no longer the way to look at things anymore, right? Because things change too quickly. So in this example here, you see you have a, an application called an org portal, and you have a load balancer, a database, and a web server. And each of these needs to get access to different things in order to work successfully, GitHub, for example, or Ubuntu. And the key is to be able to know that GitHub and Ubuntu uh, do the same set of, of, of auto-scaling as you do. It's very impossible to keep a track of a large list of IP addresses. So in this way here, by having the flexibility of fully qualified domain names, it allows you to very easily make policy sets that are based on that. And therefore, with just a few rules, lock down a policy tightly versus having to constantly keep track of how many lists there are. Of, of, for example, I remember the previous job, the Windows Update servers. You know, keeping track of what addresses to allow for Windows updates was, was quite arduous. And so that's why that that's kind of, is very critical. Um, and then finally, beyond segmentation and having flexible segmentation with visibility, 
having those additional breach detection and response features uh, ensures that you'll be in a situation where you can take advantage of these, where your policy's in play, but you still need to be able to figure out, uh, hey, you know, what if something gets beyond here? So the biggest thing in, in lateral movement is when people get in, that's the humans or the hygiene flaws. The worry is, is they start moving around the environment laterally and you know, shaking door handles and trying to get in places. So being able to take advantage of failed connections and people moving laterally and detect them and put them into a honeypot is critical. We talked earlier about our ability to have a great reputation store of east-west lateral movement uh, in our CTI, which you can all take advantage of. Uh, that comes into play. We get to see toolkits and other things, you know, whether it's a process or where, where they're trying to go. Uh, that also helps um, uh, find people doing negative things on the attackers, as well as file integrity monitoring and uh, as well as other forensics that you get out of it. And that's pretty much my overview of what you probably want to have uh, as far as a software-defined segmentation solution. And with that said, I'm going to give it back to Sarah. Thank you so much, Dave, and uh, thanks to Gal as well. I'm, I'll be honest, I'm overwhelmed with new knowledge, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to need to review this entire this entire presentation. I'm actually going to remind uh, to everybody who's been listening uh, in the audience, uh, there you will be getting a message tomorrow, 24 hours after this with a live link to the presentation so you can watch the entire thing. That will include all of the presentation materials so you'll be able to download the slides and take all kinds of notes on them and all that fun stuff so you can uh, uh, learn even more than you just have. Uh, we are going to have some time for questions. So before we begin with today's q and I'd like to remind you that we will be having a feedback form that's going to open when the webcast and so to complete that form, just press the Submit Answer button at the bottom of the page. Thanks in advance for doing that. Your participation in the survey does allow us to better serve you. Now on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in Q&A, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window, or click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and then click the Submit button. So first of all, uh, gentlemen, um, you've given us so much advice today. I think well, let's start with simply what are the most common ways that I can screw this up? <laughs> There's definitely going to be mistakes <laughs> that organizations make when they try to use micro-segmentation. You've so told us so many ways to do it well, but it's it's not an easy it's not necessarily an easy project. So, so, um, but Dave, I'm going to start with you because you've carried a lot of organizations through this process. When they're, um, what are the most common mistakes, the the pitfalls that everybody listening today should be on guard about? What what if you want to make sure that they avoid when they start this journey? One of the things we've started to do is offer uh, a free one-day workshop when, when we start the project. And the first thing we tell people is these are probably the, the groups you want to attend. So you, you know, you're either brought in by uh, a security group or an infrastructure group, in my experience. And usually we say, why don't you bring the DevOps team in and let them sit in as well? Because mm -hmm. I think it's important to have all three of those groups. Um, and that's, that's number one. Uh, because one, uh, what we find is, when uh, the DevOps team sees the kind of visibility we provide into their applications and application dependencies, uh, instead of being negative about it, they, they, they find it um, it's something really cool. And then when you, you say you have options for agent and agent lists and, and things like that, they even think it's even more cool. And usually they have uh, some ideas of, of the application dependencies and some additional information that they can provide you, like a CMDB database and things like that. Um, so having all three groups together to talk about it is important. The second thing is really understanding that software-defined segmentation is a whole array of use cases. A lot of people think it's very much um, protecting between the apps of an, uh, sorry, protecting between the segments of an application, but it really is any kind of software-defined segmentation you may need 
in the modern world. So we've had situations where groups get together and talk, and they'll have these are the five critical projects this year, and they only think one of them is microsegmentation, when in fact, you know, four of the five still are microsegmentation, right? And they didn't realize that jump boxes or critical servers or other things that they thought were, were different actually st still come back to microsegmentation. Um, and, and that's that's the thing. So I would say having the right people from the very beginning in the room, and then two, understanding is let's take a wide, broad approach of what you want to do this year, and then we, we'll see where segmentation fits in. And they, they find out it's surprisingly more than they, they thought. Mm. Thank you. Gal, anything to add there? Yeah, I think uh, from a management point of view is, is uh, communication, understanding that uh, if you're the typical enterprise, you really have no idea what's happening east-west. Uh, you might think you do, but you don't understand the volume and the complexity of what's going on uh, east-west, even if you have a pretty good um, understanding of what's happening north-south. I was a uh, virtual CISO of a SMB that was very highly targeted. We had everything we thought locked down and properly um, uh, monitored, full PCAPs, north-south, DNS, uh, anti-malware, EDR, you name it. And in 2015, I had someone come in and do some consulting, and they found seven Windows laptops in a follow-the-leader configuration outbound to the Internet and uh -huh. through a, a built-in wow. um, uh, uh, WiMAX uh, radio, LTE radio, sorry. So none of that was visible north-south, and it wasn't visible in the DNS north-south or the EDR because it wasn't malware. Uh, and the kind of lateral movement that was happening there was due to built-in Windows networking protocol stuff. And the only thing that we gave this company was switch logs. That was the one thing that we did not have. We thought we had a lot of telemetry, but we did not have switch logs. And so once you get into a situation where you are able to shine a light at these kind of you know, cheesy term, dark corners on the east-west traffic, your ability to see interesting things and important things is uh, is astoundingly kind of endless, uh, so that you, you need the technical expertise relating to how to ingest that and understand what it means, because if you go out and kind of ping your social network and professional network and say, hey, who can help me? with uh, you know, Cisco Firewall and Cisco IDS. 100 people will say, I know I have 10, ex 10 years experience. It's okay, if I gave you switch logs from, from the same company, one of the most important networking vendors, would you be able to find lateral movement? And they'll look at you funny like you fell off the moon because it's such a weirdly exotic skill set. Uh, and it really shouldn't be because it's that important and we, yet d we do not have that as a commodity yet. So that's why I'm excited that you know, the, the, the vendors in this space probably about five, six years old or so, really interesting stuff. And uh, it, it, you need people to understand uh, how to take advantage of that uh, capability. Well, it's interesting. So a lot of what you're saying is exciting to those of us here on the call because lateral movement, we're worrying about lateral movement and worrying about fileless non-malware attacks is something that everybody in the security community is is kind of sweating right now. Um, and micro-segmentation fits right into the, the category of trying to solve some of those particular things as well as other things. But one of the questions that has just come in is that uh, uh, this person is having the trouble of having micro-segmentation seen as a security-only technology. And, and since we've just said uh, lateral movement and uh, fileless attacks, those aren't even necessarily security challenges that people outside of the security department are really familiar with right now. So how do you convince other IT teams who do not necessarily see the point or the ROI of micro-segmentation to buy into it? How do you convince them that there is um, a value to it? Because if you want to um, 
have them as part of the process, as Dave was suggesting before, um, and also probably have them as part of the team that's going to spend some of the money on, on the deployment, how do you show them that it also is valuable to their departments as well? Um, either one of you want to jump in on that first? Sure, sure. I, I'd say that there, there's a few things in play. So, so I talked about um, the visibility, both real-time and historical, is found to be very valuable by infrastructure people and by DevOps people. So it's kind of a, a carrot. But more importantly than that, I think uh, the, the biggest ways that we've gotten them involved, uh, I'm thinking of one company as an example. Uh, we had an infrastructure team that wasn't, wasn't really – uh, enthusiastic at first, but said, listen, the problem we have this year is we have a development network and a production network that aren't separate. And there are 800 VLANs where they overlap. And it'll take us four years to fix that. That's what we're working on right now. And I said, well, you realize that's, that's a segment, software-defined segmentation solution because basically we can go ahead and deploy agents and instead of having you spend four years re-IP addressing 800 different VLANs, you just simply write a policy that says dev to production, production to dev. And that was a huge uh, business driver for them. So that's, a, that's an example of an infrastructure team that was really happy uh, because of this. Another example I can give is compliance, is the fact mm. uh, is because what we do, they can say uh, my TCI systems uh, are isolated from the rest of the environment. And not only can I, I do that quickly without having to visit all my locations that have these, these devices, or in the case of banking, SWIFT, you know, uh, there's, there's about a uh, half dozen standards that really come into play. And then the fact that segmenta- software-defined segmentation, when done the way it has historical visibility, we can even say we can validate, ongoing validation, that we can show you all the packets and all the traffic, nothing but is going to PCI with what you, you explicitly say. So I think in, in, beyond the initial carrots of visibility that both DevOps and infrastructure like, beyond, uh, beyond the fact that we often help infrastructure teams do things in, in days that would take, if they were using traditional segmentation, years and a lot of money, uh, the big thing is compliance has been the other thing that has come into play that, that really uh, helps people along the process. Excellent. All right, gentlemen, well, we are just about at the end of our time here together. So I'm going to give you each about 30 seconds to give your final thoughts of all the things you've said today. What is the one thing you want to make sure that the audience leaves with today? Gal, you're up first. Hit it. Sure. uh, Hopefully by now we don't have to sell you that segmentation is important. So uh, my advice would be find uh, an internal technical champion and an internal business champion that will help you get uh, some prioritization for an exploratory project where you start understanding who the people and the stakeholders internally would be and what they care about. And again, make sure that it's not just seen as a uh, security issue. It helps with audit, helps with uh, complexity, helps with uh, uh, faster management of change. Uh, so I would start with um, getting the right people involved and then uh, doing uh, a quick bake-off with some consultants slash vendors around getting that first piece of visibility that you do not yet have today. Because once you see that, people will see, I can't live without this. This is uh, not a luxury. This is important. I think, I think Gal, some of some the wonderfully, I think he, he uh, summarized it wonderfully. What I would add is, is uh, basically uh, re-examine the projects you have on your plate to protect uh, in your data center, in your clouds, in your hybrid cloud environment, uh, and look at the ways that you're trying to protect them and say, can software-defined segmentation be applied here? And that's the biggest thing for me is, is that uh, once they understand the visibility factor and everything that, that Gal talked about, is when they realize that the word microsegmentation is actually uh, a broad bunch of use cases that grows and grows and grows. I have a list, and the list keeps getting longer and longer and longer because I, I keep track of these things. Uh, people realize it, it, is, it is applicable in a lot more places than they thought. 